Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Neon Museum's third annual Scholar in Residence Lecture, part of our Times of the Signs educational series. My name is Cynthia Bear Warso, and I'm Education and Engagement Manager at the Neon Museum. I'm extremely proud to stand before you, before you tonight as a representative of the Neon Museum. It's a wonderful organization with an amazing team of staff and volunteers who work very hard to bring quality programming to Las Vegas. I'd like to take a moment to thank those who have supported the Neon Museum and our mission and who make this program and programs like it possible. First and foremost, the Neon Museum's Board of Trustees who volunteer their valuable time and expertise to further our mission. We can't thank you enough. Also, our partner tonight, UNLV's Barrett Museum and their staff, thank you for your support and for allowing us to feel at home here in your auditorium, not only tonight, but for our previous scholar in residence lectures and for your partnership with our upcoming Artist in Residence program. Heartfelt thank you. I'd also like to thank John Humphreys of Earth, Water, Sky, Las Vegas event production company for his help in providing us audio, visual, <coughs> lighting, videography for our programs and for being a great friend of the Neon Museum. Thank you, John. Finally, our sincere gratitude to our community of supporters. Those of you who attend our lectures, our panel discussions, and our educational programs. Those of you who are members of the Neon Museum. Those who have supported our annual Boneyard Bash, our tireless volunteers, and those individuals, businesses, and partners in the community who have donated funds that, to allow programs like this and many other initiatives at the Neon Museum become a reality. Thank you so much. Tonight, you will see we have comment cards for you out of the table. Uh, if you would please take a moment to provide feedback about this lecture and let us know about any other kinds of programming or lectures or topics you would like to hear about, we'd really appreciate it. We want to uh, be responsive to your needs and your interests and part of your community. So please, it's, it's really important um, and you may leave the cards in the box that's on the table out there on the way out. Tonight, the Neon Museum warmly welcomes our 2016 scholar in residence, Stefan Au, an internationally known architect, author, and academic specializing in contemporary urbanization. We are honored to have you here tonight. Stefan is a Dutch architect, a designer, as I said, an associate professor of urban design at the University of Pennsylvania. His international career has included work as a practicing architect on renowned projects such as the 2000 foot high Canton Tower, Stratosphere of Guangzhou, China. Stefan has also served as an advisor to governments, including Hong Kong, consulting on the development of the city's harbor and external lighting guidelines. He has published various books about contemporary urbanization, including Factory Towns of South China, Village in the City, and Mall City, and is currently writing a book about Las Vegas architecture called The Strip. So we're anxiously awaiting to see that when it comes out. Tonight, Stefan will deliver a presentation entitled Bigger, Better, and Brighter, The Evolution of Las Vegas Science, discussing how the cutthroat competition between casinos and unlikely source of architectural innovation has helped the Las Vegas Strip become the breeding ground of unprecedented sign design evolution. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Stefan Powell. Thank you, uh, Cynthia, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thank the Neo Museum for bringing me here. It's really a terrific honor. Uh, and today is my whole day at the uh, Neo Museum. And uh, I'm at all of the wonderful uh, people and the, the, the team uh, that's part of it. And, I remember when I first came to Vegas uh, 10 years ago, I visited the museum, and I've, I've seen it uh, over a period of 10 years uh, become uh, really professional, and, and it's so wonderful to see that, uh, and to see so many of you uh, here today. So thank you also uh, for coming, for braving the weather. I hope I didn't bring any of the East Coast weather uh, out to Las Vegas. Uh, and I know I have a very daunting task ahead of me, because so many of you uh, are actually uh, sign experts. In fact, I was just talking to uh, a gentleman here on the front row, 
uh, who told me he uh, designed the Port Rochero of Circus Circus, which you could go out and see uh, today. So I had a very difficult uh, task uh, ahead of me. Uh, I am a, I'm an architect. Uh, I, I design uh, buildings, not signs. But I also studied uh, the shape of cities, in particular urban form, how it comes to be and how it changes the way in which it structures our lives. I've been studying the strip for about a decade now. It's always hard to explain to my colleagues at the university that I go to Las Vegas for research. <laughs> but I have to say, I, I, I explain them why, then, you know, they, they, after a while, they, they, they become convinced that I have uh, no ulterior motives. But, but let me present you with some of the research uh, today. What's so fascinating about the strip is how it's grown so fast. Over a period of only 70 years, 70 years, it's grown from a puffled road dribbling through the desert to a high-density boulevard. And here you can see the uh, strip's footprint from the 1950s all the way to today. Behind the growth of the strip lies the growth of its main building block, individual casinos. This is the Flamingo in 1946, first city center uh, today. To study this growth more carefully, I constructed about uh, uh, literally hundreds of 3D models of each and every casino and also each, each and every sign uh, when they first opened. For the 1941 El Rancho, to the 2010 Cosmopolitan. Uh, what I found is that the casino has developed from literally a small uh, box with about 50 rooms to 5,000 room mega structures. So this is not one of those ink block tests they, they get people uh, figure out some psychological problems. Uh, this is actually the, the footprints of the casinos uh, as they've grown from 19. 41 till uh, today, uh, and, and what you see how uh, these complexes have become ever bigger, uh, not just uh, on the ground level, but also towers, all the black spots uh, are towers. And they include some of the world's largest building, the, the plaza for instance is larger than uh, the Pentagon. I also looked at the, uh, the way in which architects designed uh, the buildings, and in particular the facades. But what's interesting is how their attitudes towards design changed. For instance, when the casinos were first built, they tried very hard to make casinos look bigger than they actually were. So Royal Nevada built a tower here. Uh, but today, because the buildings are so large, they try to uh, make buildings look small. Uh, and the wind uh, here, what you see is, is, is one stripe, but what appears as one floor is actually two floors to make the building look smaller. Because uh, uh, now it, it can potentially dehumanize uh, guests. I've also studied pool shapes. And the pool has evolved from a simple square, the 1941 El Rancho to round squares, even letter letter shaped uh, uh, pools. Today, to multi tiered uh, climate controlled dome covered nightclubs. So we can we can really speak uh, of an evolution. It's almost like a species. Uh, they're winning competition between resorts. The question is, why did competition play out over design? Why did the uh, resorts put so much effort in the design of their uh, buildings and their pools? Uh, well, design was used as a way to distinguish uh, the companies that were offering, offering similar services. All of these buildings that you see fundamentally do the same thing. Uh, they offer gambling, accommodation, and entertainment. Just like so companies compete by different packages, so developers wrapped gambling in different facades. It was simply marketing. As a result of this intense competition between multiple companies on a single street, the strip has become highly volatile. Uh, new ideas get introduced very quickly, 
so it, it, usually I, I give a talk about the architecture, and then uh, it's really about how the strip has seen seven different architectural periods over a period of you know seven decades. It's really quite phenomenal. So the first resorts were built in, in the Western style at a time Western movies were very popular. Uh, you probably know that you know, in, the, in the late uh, 80s and the early 90s, uh, they were uh, built as uh, Disney style uh, casinos. This was at a time when the Disney Corporation was the world's largest entertainment corporation, and the strip wanted to actively pursue families. And today, it's star architecture. Uh, it, as a way to attract a more higher end uh, clientele and, and millennium. So it's a highly volatile place. By now you must be thinking, hold on, wasn't this talk going to be about science? Okay, let, let me uh, give you the, the main takeaway uh, of, of, of this talk. Uh, here it is on this slide. Uh, okay. According, from my perspective, I think there's about five different periods when it comes to uh, sign design. There's uh, Googie, there's the golden age of signage, there's the whiteboard period, the, the monuments, and the today, the, the, a lot of the new signs are LED screen. And it's really a tremendous evolution. The sign has evolved from a simple pool in a box to LED skyscrapers. At heart, it's simple human nature. Call attention to one casino, an owner puts up a sign. Then the next owner puts up a bigger one. The president of Yesco, Las Vegas' most prolific sign company, remembered the gamblers would say, you gotta put me up a bigger one than so-and-so got down the street. But it wasn't just bigger, better, and brighter. Sometimes the sign take, uh, signs take completely different forms, sometimes they, they're also no longer bigger, as, as what happened in the 70s. So I'll, I'll get into that. So the first phase uh, is, is Googie. This was an architectural period that emerged in the 1930s in Los Angeles. And Googie refers to the name of a coffee shop that was built in that particular style. It was really, it's a very kind of modern, futuristic style. And a lot of the architects that worked uh, in, uh, on the strip at that time, uh, they, they were from uh, Los Angeles. So that's why this style was so uh, influential. There's two trends that uh, I think are, are characteristic of this. First is how signs were integrated in, in the buildings. They weren't quite separate. Uh, and, and secondly, that uh, the signs are very sculptural uh, pop art like forms. So the Iran show, 1941, uh, the first casino resort uh, had some neon, not a lot, uh, and it was pretty much here. The, the windmill was lined with neon, and it said El Rancho Vegas uh, in neon. Notice that this wasn't an actual windmill. It was actually a tower that housed the air conditioning equipment. Uh, and actually, it was a, you can also say it was a sign. Right? It didn't, uh, didn't actually pump water. It was just there to attract people uh, to come uh, to the resort. It was uh, marketed. Now, a few years later, after other casino resorts came, and uh, more signs came, they had to build a second sign down on the street. So this was a detached from the building, and it pointed to the tower in case you miss it. <laughs> now, the second resort in the strip, the last frontier, also integrated beyond on the building. Notice how here it says Fire Station 1856. This building was actually built in, in 1946, uh, but uh, it was meant to represent an old uh, Western style uh, fire station. That's why also here you see a neon style uh, or, or, or a neon sign of a uh, horse drawn um, uh, fire truck. So before leaving the, the last frontier, the fuel of your Cadillac at this Western style Texaco gas station. Let's see. Oh, I have some technical difficulty. So we see 
seen the windmill, uh, we've seen the uh, horse-drawn <coughs> fire truck, then came the birds, the flamingo and the thunderbird. Now, they do look like birds of a feather, but take a closer look, and there's quite some significant uh, differences. The thunderbird uh, came after the flamingo. So, the thunderbird, in contrast to the flamingo's very flat figure, is more voluptuous. It's also a more colorful bird, in contrast to the more monochrome uh, flamingo. And it's set more prominently, prominently on the strip. Its tower sank into, uh, its, its, its claws sank into the tower. In addition to that, uh, it was actually not one single bird, it was two birds, right? So one uh, bird that was integrated in the building and one that stood, uh, stood by the strip. So these signs completely change the uh, experience of the driver. And there's a great article about that time that first writes about driving through Las Vegas, and it's called Sights for Riders. Uh, because these neon signs really uh, presented uh, impressive sights for people who, who uh, drove by. There were barely any street lights, so imagine uh, driving there. Now the competition heats. So after the birds, uh, we see a few uh, desert themes, and Desert Inn used a uh, cactus. And notice how it appears to grow from the roof here. It was really integrated uh, into the building. By the way, this is not a native uh, Arizona, a, a native Nevada a cactus. It's a saguaro cactus, which is a more curvy, a more uh, sexy, uh, you could say, uh, uh, cactus that's native to uh, Arizona. Uh, but it became uh, part of the identity of the resort. Uh, and it was later, when, when the high rise was built, uh, hoisted up. Now, Alan has the architectural historian also noted how uh, this kind of curvilinear shape uh, was reminiscent of contemporary art forms at the time, including Jean Mirau and Alexander Kelder. Then there are the very strong figurative signs, and probably uh, one of the most famous is uh, Vegas Vic. So trying to get people to notice the casino, the Pioneer Club built this sign, a six-story tall cow puncher smoking a cigarette, waving his hands, greeting visitors with reporting of how the partner. It gave human qualities to uh, the sign so people could relate, and they affectionately called him Vegas Vic. The silver slipper then responded with Cinderella mystique, erecting a revolving sign of a high heeled woman's shoe the size of a car. And I saw this one today because it's been rebuilt right uh, outside of the new museum. It's a still very evocative uh, sign. So this is a sculptural sign because you don't need letters to understand that this is a slipper. Dunes went after Arabian Nights, building a three-story smiling fiberglass <coughs> sultan, hands on his hips, his cape falling from his shoulders, his plumed turban lit by a car light. So sign designers had to be quite creative uh, in building these signs. So in order for uh, the, the Tulpan to uh, attract some more attention, they put a car light uh, in his, in his uh, turban. Uh, then the Hacienda built not a three story but a four story uh, sign, according to customers, with a caballero, a stripe, a palomino. A decade later, to draw attention away from Vegas Vic, the Pioneer Club's cowboy uh, sign down the street, Stupak sign for his casino, featured the voluptuous Vegas Vicky, a lot more sensual uh, than the uh, original cowboy. And this is a picture from the Neon uh, Museum. I just saw this this morning. It's a fantastic uh, acrylic drawing. And it's, it's almost hard to see, but when you see the original, uh, you can see how the paint is really uh, beautiful fluorescent. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a piece of art. Uh, the second phase, the golden age of science, is the most unique phase of uh, Las Vegas uh, 
signage, you could say. Uh, no longer were IDs incorporated from other places. This was no longer a style that was derivative of uh, Los Angeles. This was uh, Las Vegas' uh, unique style. It also coincides with uh, new money pouring into Las Vegas, Teamster pension funds, uh, that became uh, available and, and uh, casino owners were willing to spend it on building uh, and leasing these very large sites. There's a few things that I think are uh, characteristic, so-called nose buildings, uh, big screens or decorated sheds, and the old pilots. In strict architectural terms, a bull nose stands for a rounded edge, typically of a tile, not in Las Vegas. In 1956, the Golden Nugget decorated the casino's entire entrance with a 30 by 30, 34 foot bulbous nose containing a Golden Nugget the size of a car and flanked by neon balls with a flowery Victorian border. So you can actually see this in the Neon Museum, and, and, and it was wonderful to see also this nugget. And that's how people, when, when they see this sign, remember that this was the Golden Nugget. The horseshoe then responded with its own bull nose, a three-story nose that had a, a concave shape. Here it is. Uh, etched by two aqua-colored walls, using a total of eight miles of neon tubing. Again, this is a, 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 a part of this sign you can see at the Neon Museum. You see these interlocking H's. Uh, that, that make up this nose. You could really speak of a battle of the noses uh, because the mint responded with its own nose, its own corner entrance, uh, and this was affectionately called the eyebrow uh, on the corner. But perhaps the most impressive of all was uh, Lucky, uh, which got a facelift in 1963 two curving, flaming red surfaces that came together uh, into a narrow nose as tall as a 16-story building kept by a glaring helix. Tom Wolfe called it, called it Flash Gordon Ming Alert Spiral. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what he wrote of Vegas uh, of that period. Las Vegas is the only town in the world whose skyline is made up neither of buildings like New York nor trees like Wilbraham, Massachusetts, the signs. One can look at Las Vegas from a mile away on Route 91 and see no buildings, no trees, only signs. But such signs, they tower, they revolve, they oscillate, they soar in shapes before which the existing vocabulary of art and history is helpless. Now I had to think back of Tom Wolfe this morning uh, at the Neo Museum when I, uh, I talked to uh, uh, one of the uh, collection managers and uh, and particularly this term of the unconscious avant-garde. Because she told me that uh, when she talked to one of the sign designers, they're always a little surprised that uh, they call them artists. Uh, for them, uh, they, they, they see that just, they're just doing, uh, doing uh, their job. Uh, and for them to get so much attention, uh, they're, they're a bit surprised. They, they think they're a little kooky at the New York Museum. Uh, for, for constructing uh, a museum uh, or a museum dedicated to their work, but I think gradually it, they realize that this is uh, truly uh, phenomenal stuff. But I'm also very impressed, particularly by this period of, of neo science and the structure of, like the, the Lucky is really uh, incredible uh, for me. It only existed for a few years, and there's actually not a lot of pictures of it. So if any one of you happens to have a nice picture of it, please let me know. Uh, I'm very impressed by this building. It was a, a truly uh, incredible experience because of the light bulbs they made heat uh, and also a lot, a lot of light, so you, you wouldn't quite know whether it, it was day uh, or night. Uh, and walking down Fremont Street felt like being a piece of toast uh, brown on both sides, stuck in a toaster, two stories tall. Now then there's the, 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 the second trend. So I talked about the noses. Uh, the other trend I think that's significant is the big screens, or uh, otherwise known as the decorated shed. 
So here's the, the first one, it's the Stardust on the, uh, picture on the, on the strip. It's assigned the length of a jumbo jet. Uh, what's so interesting about the sign was really mixed media. I mean, with, with neon, you don't just mean neon, but in this case, it meant neon, light bulbs, uh, automobile painted sheet metal, and plexiglass. For instance, uh, this big sphere oh, that was placed in the middle of the sign uh, was a 16 ton acrylic sphere. It's pro probably the uh, world's largest or heaviest sphere uh, ever constructed. Of course, this was built at the uh, peak of the space race, so it included a uh, Sputnik, uh, and, and people would go there and they would photograph themselves uh, with, with at, at the background uh, they had assigned. So they placed some rockets over here so you could stand next to the rocket and, and have uh, your picture taken. It was, it was kind of producing the first Kodak, or shall I say, Instagram moment. <laughs> uh, at the time, right? it's uh, the, the contemporary equivalent of, of uh, a Venetian canal. It's otherwise known as a decorated shed. So if you look at the uh, overview of the building, only this part was, uh, was the sign. Everything else was not special. It's just almost like a shed-like building, uh, building the style of, of uh, industrial or, or, or military barracks perched atop a uh, parking lot. It wasn't even money spent on, on uh, landscaping. But you could argue that uh, by, by doing this, uh, it made the Las Vegas vacation affordable. This was a thousand rooms uh, that uh, were being offered for half, as, uh, half the price of another uh, uh, Las Vegas hotel. And the sign covered up this lack of sophisticated architecture. Uh, so you could almost say that the sign allowed for this uh, to exist because it gave people who walked uh, to their uh, hotel rooms, obviously through the casino, but they would have to pass the sign and it gave them a celestial experience away uh, from the everyday. Now the big screen also helped uh, solve an important problem. Resorts expanding with building new towers, larger casinos and restaurant additions were presented with an aesthetic dilemma. The overall of the existing and newer structures, often a mishmash of different style buildings with unrelated heights, made for a visually incoherent front. How could resorts expand while maintaining a consistent and impressive identity? But the same happened for uh, the Thunderbirds. So it grew bigger, bigger, uh, built new additions, different styles, different heights. It became a little messy. So they decided, let's, buy, let's build a 560 foot screen that covers it all. Uh, and uh, we, 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 uh, we not only create a unity, we also create uh, a lot of attention. And when the start of sign was figurative, it just depicted a solar system, the T-Bird's face was abstract. It didn't depict anything. It was a sheer wall of light bulbs, 37,000 points of light in total, about the same amount as a low definition television, which flickered nonstop. Notice how the old neon bird uh, had been repurposed and put on, into this uh, large pillar. So we get this big screen war. Uh, the Stardust done response with an even longer uh, big screen, and it got rid of the uh, more figurative uh, uh, starburst uh, and, and built an animated tapestry of neon stars. The length of two football fields consisted of a grid of units with different sized neon stars, each of a different color. But what's so fascinating about the sign that by lighting different uh, colored neon at the same time, it could create all these patterns and the building could actually change color. So it was a shed uh, that could uh, change from red to green uh, to white, uh, etc. Et this was about the same time as the development of, of color uh, television. And as soon as new even phosphors uh, colors uh, became available, they were tested out uh, on the Las Vegas Strip. 
But there was a drawback to the big screen. For the sake of attention and unification, the screen concealed portions of the hotel wings. Rooms that previously provided a view of the strip now face the back of an electric sign. <laughs> Moreover, with transformers going up to 15,000 volts per tube, the electric screen also buzzed. While a nuisance to guests, it had an unintended benefit for the hotel, keeping gamblers awake to bring them into the casino. <laughs> So the third trend of that era uh, are these very large neon pilots. And these are probably the, the most uh, well-known neon structures uh, in the world. Inspired by a decade of growing neon signs on the strip, in 1964, the Dunes decided to up the ante. They built the world's largest sign, a 181 feet tall silhouette evoking an onion dome constructing out, constructed out of three miles of neon tubing. 7,200 electric lamps. Casinos weren't solely measured by the length of their signs in full erection. Among sign designers, the, zoo, the Dunes was uh, respected for its contained design and use of positive and negative space, the use of light to make it look taller than its 181 foot, and the way it fills the area at which you're looking with light. So it was admired for sign designers because it wasn't just a simple shaft. Uh, but it was actually uh, quite wide and it covered uh, a large area. It was also incredibly bright uh, and reportedly uh, patrons in the tower had trouble sleeping and, and management had to install blackout curtains. What's, uh, what's also really fascinating about this project, and it happens with other projects too, that there was a tension between the architect of the tower, in this case Milton Schwartz, architect from Chicago, who was trained in the conventional modernist way, and the uh, design designer. Obviously, the architect didn't uh, was not very excited about seeing this tall, uh, uh, somewhat phallic structure uh, <laughs> rising next to uh, his tower. Two years later, the Aladdin retaliated with a more whimsical figure, a string of golden cylinders gradually curling into a revolving wedge topped by a gold fountain floating on uh, floating an oil lamp. Uh, the inside story here is that those cylinders that you see are actually constructed out of uh, beer cans. Uh, it was much larger than the building, and uh, the architect obviously uh, was not too pleased. So this was, uh, there was a competition for the sign, and what's quite fascinating is that around this period, uh, because the commissions got so big, these were uh, million dollar uh, structures, there's more sign companies entering uh, Las Vegas, including federal sign company, ad art, it wasn't just YesGo. And to commission these uh, big structures, they held design competitions. And the competition was quite, quite fierce. So here we have this team uh, with, uh, with uh, Hendrik Larson looking very intensely <laughs> at his creation. Uh, but they had to present this sign to the client, Mil client Mil Milton Pro, uh, and the architect uh, was there. And, and this is uh, some of the discussion that, that apparently uh, went on over there. This is what the architect said. Architect said, God, I hate it. That's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't what you want, the architect said, as Milton Pro, uh, the owner, walked in. No, I want to see it, said Prell. Let me take a look at it. Prell was thrilled. Oh my god, where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Milton, said the architect, I knew you'd love it. He wasn't going to lose his client over some aesthetic fixation. <laughs> so the true war uh, between these neon pillars emerged, and if the Aladdin was quite uh, evocative because of its sculptural and whimsical shape. Uh, the frontier was a, a, a true uh, tour de force with a large bar that gravitated. And, and notice how these, uh, this pile was deliberately painted blue so it would appear as if it was floating uh, during the, the day. Uh, we also see some innovation in terms of this font. It was meant to uh, create this subliminal message of, of, of playing cards, uh, 
which you can somewhat see uh, in this depth. Then, of course, after this, the, the frontier was 184 feet. It was three feet taller than the dunes. Then came the Stardust sign, which was 188 feet, uh, four feet taller than, uh, than the frontier. Uh, and uh, it, it dazzled with an animation sequence of a shimmering star cloud. And also the two legs were painted light blue, so it appeared to flow. So important were the signs that they even held opening ceremonies, typically uh, a mayor and a hotel owner and a few showgirls uh, that, that, that would be there. There's also publicity photos that you, that you find when new signs were open. Here is a, a shot of a showgirl uh, planting her figure in front of the, uh, the blue signs, standing on a very large uh, pile of light bulbs. Uh, these are the images that you, you don't think would be uh, uh, used by casinos today. Uh, they're not going to tell you how much energy or, or light bulbs <laughs> or water uh, they're using. But uh, what's really key here uh, is that uh, the, the, the Stardust was uh, admired by sign designers for its unique program. And that included uh, the way in which it, it sweet, the way in which it had washdowns and random scintillation. That sign design lingo for uh, flickering. But if you want to take a, a, a closer look at uh, the original blueprint, again, you should go to the Neon Museum because uh, they have this drawing here. Uh, it's really incredible to, to imagine how a drawing about this size led to a structure uh, of 188 feet. It's quite Amazing. So deviated from the two-legged shaft, uh, the, the dunes, uh, the, the, the stardust, and the frontier, came uh, the, the uh, world's largest single shaft sign, uh, the flamingo, at uh, 130 feet. A plumed pink feather built out of two miles of the tubing and 6,000 light bulbs. General Electric, please with all this light business, awarded it sign of the year. <laughs> Around this time, two architecture professors, uh, they took their students to uh, Las Vegas, uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, and they started to study uh, the strip and its signs. And they claimed that Vegas architecture of signs communi communicated better to the people than conventional buildings. And they started advocating uh, to architects uh, that they should also go back to using symbols. This is the very famous book that was published uh, as a result, uh, Learning from Las Vegas. Uh, and and kind of the key message that, uh, that, that they gave uh, architects is that, uh, that uh, instead of a building that looks like a monument, it's better to have a building that just says what it is. Uh, I am a monument, and then we all know uh, what it is. Instead of these kind of hidden messages that you can only get when you're when you go to architecture school for five years, uh, and, and after being brainwashed like I have been, uh, you can see those uh, hidden meanings. So for them, uh, Las Vegas was more democratic. And that's the argument they made. Now, it was a very influential book, uh, and it, it kick-started uh, postmodernism in architecture, influencing architects worldwide. So the next phase, uh, the whiteboards were the, the plastic boxes. And there, there's two key uh, elements to that, I think, uh, which are the, the whiteboards and the port uh, cocheres. And again, I'm very honored to uh, have the port share design here uh, amongst us. So this happened at a moment of uh, technological change. Uh, translucent acrylic plastic became available. Uh, the advantage of that is that uh, you could make a plastic box, put neon inside instead of outside. It was no longer exposed, uh, so it could better bear the weather. And the assumption was also that they were more energy uh, efficient assumption that turned out uh, not entirely true. <laughs> but these white boards, or, or these plastic reader boards, uh, became dominant. 
And there's a very sharp shift that you see uh, away from uh, the world's largest signs to these, from these tall signs to, to the more square, uh, squarish boxes uh, that then uh, emerge. The key moment was 1973 when the MGM Grand was built. Uh, it was then the world's largest hotel. But to everyone's surprise, the new world's largest hotel decided not to build the world's largest sign. Uh, the, the, the corporate manager uh, of that time, Fred Benninger, decided to continue, discontinue the sign race. Why do you think uh, this happened? Well, the president argued, this building is so large, you no longer need a sign <laughs> uh, because you will notice it uh, regardless. I notice here the new sign, uh, you know, it's, it's really a lot smaller uh, than, than the doom sign. But the truth is that there was a lot more uh, going on uh, at the time. Uh, whiteboards weren't just uh, introduced because of that. Neon had lo lost his luster nationwide in the 1970s associated with signs sputtering XXX at CD theaters. They also deemed more energy efficient. Uh, Notice that 1973 was the year of the oil embargo. And finally, it coincided with the new uh, corporate finance space in Las Vegas, when corporations are allowed uh, to own and operate uh, casinos. What's this the end of Neon? Well, Neon was still used. In fact, Neon was just uh, inside the box, and it was used also uh, a lot more sparingly on the outside. So remember the whimsical sign of the Aladdin? Uh, here we see its replacement. Right? Only the lamp was kept, and we see this very large uh, box uh, that gets, keeps getting larger. Uh, On existing signs, the whiteboards uh, became more and more dominant. Notice how in Caesar's Palace, this, this white reader board uh, almost doubled uh, in size uh, over time. And the experience of the strip uh, became one less so of exposed neon, but more and more so of white reader boards. I love this original sign designer, however, uh, thought that these reader boards were inferior to, uh, to the previous neon signs. And this is a quote from Kermit Wayne, who, who designed the original startups sign. There isn't as much neon. It's used more for highlighting now. And there's a lot more plastic. I really can't stand plastic. <laughs> there's a few exceptions to the dull bo bo uh, white bar boards include uh, Lucky the Clown, a uh, clown that wasn't entirely square. <coughs> because it had this uh, shapely uh, figure. And it, wa it also wasn't entirely flat. Notice how the nose is sticking out, uh, and how he's, st he's standing on the toadstools uh, right here. Another uh, exception, and by the way, uh, this image comes from a terrific book by Charles uh, Barnard. Um, the book is called The Magic Sign which I found out today is, is the Bible for people at the Neon Museum. I think it's also the, the Bible for this talk, because a lot of it is drawn uh, from that book. Yeah. Uh, so the, 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 the Westward Hell was also somewhat of, a, of an exception, uh, and it had these 80 feet tall, uh, more abstract uh, minarets. But it was only 80 feet tall. Spectacular doesn't necessarily mean immense, stated the designer. But while uh, developers had hidden uh, neon in a box instead of it being exposed, uh, the whiteboard sign still required a lot of maintenance. Yesco's maintenance crew was as busy as ever. In 1985, the servicemen twisted more than a quarter million light bulbs in Las Vegas signs. Daniel Kent, who you see here, uh, was uh, one of Yesco's uh, bulb changers. With transformers going up to tens of thousands of volt, up to 
tens of thousands of volts, it was a challenging job. I get shocked all the time, he said. It's better than a morning cup of coffee. <laughs> Ken would also change the letters on the whiteboard sign panels. A real hard day is when you have to take Wayne Newton down and put Dean Martin up, he said. You go home physically and mentally exhausted. With the Newton letters weighing between 50 and 75 pounds each, they're not easy to carry up an 80 feet ladder. I once got a hernia lifting Wayne Newton. <laughs> and like any ball change in the business, one fall was inevitable. Kenf was a 50 feet tumble from the Tropicana side, tearing his ligaments and shattering his teeth. Built by his colleagues as the most astute dead ball trucker, every night Mr. Kenf went on a two hour patrol. He would be on the lookout for slightly darker patches in whiteboards, an indication of a deadline behind it. Here we can see him driving with his head uh, out of the window, speaking in his voice recorder, he then marked the dead lamb's uh, location by describing its position within the sign. But with his eyes on the lights, talking into his voice recorder, all the while, all the while driving his car, Kemp was a bit of a road hazard. <laughs> I've gotten into some wrecks, he acknowledged. Sometimes the police pulled him over for weaving his car. There I am, sitting with a tape record, uh, recorder in my hand, and I have to tell him it's my job. Really. The police usually let him go, except for that one time when, while looking up to Lucky the Clown, he ran into a lady. I got a ticket for that one. <laughs> so back to the, the plastic uh, boxes. So if the, if the white boards didn't really dazzle, what then did? Uh, and at the 11, in, instead of the, the four squares sign, uh, there was another element that was also uh, built and designed by, by a sign uh, designer, which was the porte cochere, which stands for uh, a covered area uh, above an entrance. Uh, in other words, it is a canopy. And these porte cochere became a very important element uh, and a conveyor of identity. And here you see one uh, for the uh, Aladdin. The Aladdin canopy featured 12 door columns and a gold polished ceiling suspending three chandeliers fixtures, each the size of a truck. It was practically a freestanding building. It's another beautiful drawing from the Neon Museum, uh, known as the very large, uh, literary truck sized chandeliers. Uh, and and uh, one art critic observed how these port cachers brought the inside outside, right? So we have internal design elements that now are brought uh, in, uh, outside uh, of, of the building. Following the 1973 oil embargo, casinos plastered their buildings with reflective surfaces in an effort to reduce energy while still keeping their bright lights beaming. Polished aluminum and mirrors help, helped amplify the light sources, requiring fewer light bulbs for the same level of lumen. For instance, the starless new mirror facade glaring wall the length of five football fields consumed only a third of the electricity compared to before. As an added bonus of the, all these polished surfaces, Las Vegas glittered by night as well as by day. Then the Silverbirds Port Cachere entered the game with airplane sized wings covered in mirror glass and sparkling with lights. Uh, it's somewhat of a hybrid of a, of, between a corporate Port Cachere and a neon pillar. And if any building came close to Liberace, <laughs> this is it. For phase four, the, the monuments. So in the 1990s, casinos started to build copies um, of cities and, and replicating heritage. Replicating castles, Venetian canals, uh, Eiffel Towers, uh, and as a result, signs were adjusted so they could fit uh, into this overall uh, collage of a particular city. In 1993, Luxor copied the soaring Ramses obelisk with Luxor letters glaring above the hieroglyphics in the sacred baboons. Uh, and unlike the original, you can actually walk right underneath it uh, because this stands smack on the strip. Then the Bellagio built a sign the shape of a bell tower from its Italian name, namesake town. It had an escalator 
uh, cutting through it. The next year, the Venetian copied Venice St. Mark's clock tower right here, only to turn it into a base of a sign uh, that was uh, even bigger uh, than the entire clock tower. It also used a copy of the Campanile uh, as, a, as a sign. But the Grand de la Creme was the Paris Las Vegas sign, a copy of the 18th century Montgolfier hot air balloon. <coughs> its stripes eliminated in neon, its basket covered with video screens within gold picture frames. You can look at the uh, design drawing uh, again in the museum. It's a really amazing uh, drawing. And notice how it was meant to be in pink uh, at first, and that the base was more developed. Almost seems like a uh, Victorian style uh, mirror. Now, what appears to be a remarkable coincidence, at the same time that uh, Las Vegas developed, so on the strip started replicated heritage. Within Las Vegas, it became a, 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 a more awareness about its own heritage. Uh, and and uh, three years after the dunes uh, was imploded, and including the design that was so celebrated by the likes of Tom Wolfe, uh, and as Steve Wynn made it say, made it spell no vacancy uh, for, for the occasion. Uh, then three years later was, was uh, the founding of the Neon Museum. Because I think this event uh, helped spark uh, kind of a push for uh, preservation and sort of awareness uh, in Las Vegas uh, of, its, of its own history. Right? And we see the Neon Caballero of the Hacienda be restored. So the, the, the final phase uh, are the uh, LED screens in the last uh, until today. And uh, I think uh, the, the paradigmatic shift away from the monuments to contemporary architecture and LED screens uh, was the Aladdin. The Aladdin that opened just a few weeks before 9-11. Uh, but then after 9-11, uh, nobody wanted to go to the Aladdin anymore. It went bankrupt. Some saw it as a, as a retroactively Bin Laden-themed uh, casino. Uh, but it was then uh, repurposed into something that looked uh, super contemporary, uh, the Planet Ho Hollywood, uh, which had this uh, remarkable uh, sign facade, almost uh, reminiscent of the 1960s uh, big screens or decorated sheds. Steve Wynn then uh, built uh, this very elaborate uh, LED screen, the 10 story sign uh, that featured a three story uh, blackboard eraser, eraser that would go up and down, actually, it's still there, erasing the, the, the video screen as in a blackboard. Cosmopolitan then built an even larger LED screen. Uh, what's so interesting about this one is that the back of it is being used for displaying concerts uh, when there's concerts here um, at the pool level. But the 2013 ARIA video pilot took the record, a whooping 25 stories tall with 10,000 square feet of LEDs. Las Vegas is symptomatic of a trend of what architectural theorist Paul Aurelio calls media buildings, structures dedicated to housing information rather than habitation. In contrast to conventional architecture that presents a static image, these buildings display constantly changing scenes. Today, Today, signs need to compete with super tall uh, buildings. They're no longer the obvious uh, beacons in the landscape as they were uh, in, in the 1960s. Uh, but with uh, new technology, including LED screens, uh, which is brighter and constantly changes, uh, these signs still manage to attract attention. Uh, although, you could say, uh, one old sign, one old neon sign, until today, still manages to attract uh, attention uh, with Neon. 
In conclusion, the Las Vegas Strip has for decades been an important laboratory for sign design. Cutthroat competition between casinos helped the Las Vegas Strip become the breeding ground of unprecedented sign design evolution. The 1960s, signs transformed from a pole in a box to 20-story tall structures encompassing models of a neon. Whereas in the 1990s, signs became replicas of iconic European uh, monuments, including a full-size copy of the Bellagio Bell Tower. Uh, today's new signs include LED video screens as high as a skyscraper. Meanwhile, Las Vegas has become one of the world's most famous tourist destination and a highly influential model for iconic architecture and her entertainment. I remember when I worked uh, as an architect about 10 years ago uh, on what was then the world's uh, tallest tower, uh, the Guangzhou uh, Canton Tower, 2,000 feet, about twice the size of the stratosphere. Uh, our Chinese clients, they had visited uh, Las Vegas. And they came back to us and they wanted Bellagio fountains, stratosphere rides, and a whole lot of LEDs. <laughs> In short, <coughs> They want to Vegas. Yeah. Thank you. Fountains in 1955 that later I think appeared 
uh, within the desert inn, in the pool area. So there, there, is, there was some, you know, when one casino went derelict, it, you know, the other uh, most likely uh, could, could, could grab some, some of its key features. You told a few anecdotes about the competition between the architect and the site designer. Why do you think so much time, money, and attention was paid on the sign and the buildings themselves were so frustrating? Yeah. So I think if you if you look at the uh, the Aladdin, uh, the majority of the uh, the budget actually went to the sign, not so much the casino building. That's because there was an existing uh, structure there. It was called the, the tally hall. Why don't we go back and take a look. So Milton Pro uh, he is a businessman, right? He bought this tally hall uh, resort, which was uh, actually a resort without a casino. Right? And it, it was uh, developed by the inventor of Yatsei, uh, the board game. Uh, and it went bankrupt. Uh, so Milton Prell bought it, but instead of remodeling these buildings to represent uh, something Arabian, uh, he decided to just build a casino building in front, but then let the, let the sign itself be expressive of the identity. And that, I think, is a lot cheaper than completely remodeling all the, uh, the, the buildings to represent something new. So because this symbol was so strong, you don't really need to rely on, on architecture uh, anymore. So I, I think it was a matter of money. You never mentioned you got a break with the fear board, the electronic fear board. You're right, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. Because I mentioned it because yeah. I was the first one who designed electronic board mm -hmm. for the Domaini Brothers, one of the owners of the uh, Tropicana. Yeah. Yeah, I, the size was 100 foot wide and 20 foot high. Yeah. And uh, when they put it on, it's between Sister's Palace and the Chevron Station, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. everybody complained about it. Mm. It used to blind me when I did. Yeah, she might have heard the They were causing uh, <coughs> traffic accidents. And you know, mm. it wasn't until 10 years later that everybody Electronic reader board. That's fascinating. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great story. It, it, it should have been part of this. The electronic reader board yeah. in, in the mid '80s, and you know, Caesar's Palace built one. And I was thinking about putting a slide in there, but I was going to keep it. Well, well, you know, the other thing I thought of it wasn't actually a sign, but it was a lighting device that got the attention mm -hmm. of the building was yeah. the light at the top of the pyramid of Luxor. Yeah, the Luxor too. A big deal yeah. the time. <laughs> so you know, you're, you're absolutely right. This is a simplified narrative. Yes. You know, you know, it's reductionist. Yeah, no, I mean, you did. <laughs> I'm leaving out the I'm leaving out This the is the most organized like, study on these signs I've seen. No, but you're absolutely right. So the Luxor <laughs> beam is a phenomenal piece of technology. The world's Right, this beam that I was talking about, how it's also the world's largest buck killer uh, because it attracts all these bugs <laughs> yeah. and, and, and bats that are feasting off another. Uh, and it's uh, incredible. Uh, and, uh, I remember the, the maker of this, this that beam, he fantasized what a city would look like with all these beams uh, blowing up into the sky. It would be phenomenal. You're right. Sorry, this uh, 2020, do you have an idea what the next generation of science might be like? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think we, we should all, what's the name of that show? It's CES here in the CSE. I think we should spend some more time there. Hopefully, I will go there. I'll make some predictions. Maybe they'll have, like, you know, apps on the sign where you. I was hoping for which, that. Which machine's hot at the moment? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Um, you must come across the name Buzz Bunny. Yes. Yeah. Um, you might appreciate the fact uh, well, you constructed a sign in East Las Vegas in 1963 for a tiny strip mall called the uh, Wallace Center. And the sign itself is maybe three, four stories tall, roughly. It has, uh, it's the Gucci style, so it has an artist's palette in it. And I pass that sign about twice a day. And uh, 
this summer, so you gotta imagine it's 110 degrees out of it, uh, one of the sign companies um, restored it because lights were burned down and uh, needed repainting. So um, they, again, it was a small strip center, and uh, they, they paid a lot of money, certainly a lot of money, because there was one man there for a week with a ladder truck, a wing truck, uh, and he painted it with a paintbrush. Uh, and a roller. I watched them actually stop the car and watch them for 30 minutes on two, two separate mornings. So um, it's, uh, it's old, uh, neon lighting. <coughs> I'm just sending you a picture because it's really well, it, I'd love, I'd love to see it. Too. And I think the, the Neo Museum people there are a little bit too. Don't bother. Oh, they probably you know. They're pretty smart folks. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank well, you. What about building wraps? Is that something that's. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so I'm working on. Two books and, and discussing the wraps, and of course, it's also a sign right? because it's turning the entire building into a sign, and it's quite useful. So, for instance, the, after the financial recession, the condo part of the Venetian was never completed. But you don't want a rotting concrete carcass disrupting your idyllic Venetian scene. Uh, so they, they built, they, they printed these million dollar tarps that represented the way it should have been if it wasn't constructed to make it seem more pleasing to the eye. And then there's a D, right, which, which is covered on it. And there's also for commercials this is being used. So uh, I saw this amazing picture of a Transformer Optimus Prime uh, on, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, Luxor, uh, which is kind of the largest, the world's largest advertising uh, canvas. So imagine uh, you're up for a rude awakening when you're staying in the, in the Luxor and you're, you're opening your curtains and you peek right into Optimus Prime's uh, <laughs> eye, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's really quite, uh, quite interesting how that's also a trend. Uh, this is a, a good slide for my question. To what extent was it the rule or the exception that the signs were done uh, via uh, design competitions? And if they were design competitions, to how specific were the specs that were given to the different sign companies in terms of what they should bring to the party, so to speak? Um, yeah. Because because they weren't being trying to match to a building, obviously. So were they pretty much blank slates with a, a budget of X, or were there some yeah. more specifics in terms of so, um, so that's the competition? A good question. I can only uh, answer that because of secondary or tertiary sources. I have. I was there. Time, but yes. you can answer. The sign business is a very competitive business mm -hmm. uh, run by a salesman, mm -hmm. a bunch of artists, sketch artists, they call them. Mm -hmm. Actually, the designers have to have a knowledge of drafting so that they can be built. Uh, we're very much uh, uh, maligned for, for some reason, I don't know why. It doesn't have the prestige of, say, like uh, yeah. an interior designer or a product designer. I myself is an industrial designer. I got into design business for a Saturday. You know, like, I don't know why. So, so uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's my question. But weren't, like, a lot of design companies, like, like there was, like, a couple of main companies, and then people left those companies to open up smaller companies, and then they all became a competition with each mm -hmm. other? I'm going to tell you an experience that I had. This was very funny. Uh, I guess uh, some of my best friends were mobsters. They've been around here for a long time. I was uh, designing a sign for a fellow by the name of Jay Sarno. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, I worked on a project for two weeks, you know, uh, for a pretty salesman. And after I finished it, we were going to present it to Mr. Sarno. You know, he went over there present the project, but rendering and drafting and everything else, you know. We sat there for a long time. I said, what are we waiting for? Oh, Mr. Sun, I said, I'm waiting for uh, my girlfriend, girlfriend, whatever she was, you know, and if she liked it, you are, mm. you know. So she finally arrived over there, and she looked at him and she and Mr. Sun asked her, well, how do you like it? I said, my God, two weeks more to work. Depends upon how much you like it or not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'd have to walk back for two more weeks. You know, but 
Unfortunately, she liked it. <laughs> so, so I think that, that pretty much summarizes what, what I got from the literature is also that it was a very idiosyncratic uh, experience. And that uh, first for the stardust, uh, Mo Dalitz, yeah. at the time, one that assigned, according to Charles Bernard, to, that embodied the stardust of mystique. He didn't say, I want a cloud of stars. Yeah. Right? And, and, and then Paul Miller he came up with this little uh, sketch. Uh, of this uh, star cloud, right? which somewhat deviated from the original star burst, right? And became a shower of stars. So that was, uh, you know, some of his own interpretation. Yes, um, I know you're here to spend some time at the museum today, and I wanted to know which was your favorite sign in our collection and why. Ooh. Sitting in, in your new on Boneyard, but it, it has, uh, it has uh, its own mystique. So I really like that one. But I, I was most taken aback by these renderings, which I've never, I, I've seen some reproductions of them, I've never seen the originals. And to see the originals, it's kind of amazing. They're really works of art, the way they uh, draw and, and paint. It's beautiful. And we're talking today, hopefully, one day they can be exhibited somewhere uh, in a permanent gallery because I think they're fantastic works of art. And it was incredible to hear how they were preserved. That literally, you know, the company, I think it was Federal Design or Ada was shut down and then two of the sign designers, they just decided kind of uh, haphazardly to just remove the, 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 the paintings and keep them instead of throwing them out. That's why we still have them. It's quite beautiful. So I actually just completed a book on Macau, which is now being reviewed. Uh, I spent some time in uh, Hong Kong, and everyone said, oh, you guys study Macau, and you look at Vegas. And I said, OK, I'm going to take a look. But uh, th there was, uh, was a lot of neon there. Now it's also moving away uh, to uh, LED screens. And you know, a lot of these are Las Vegas companies, right? They bring their designs from Las Vegas uh, there. And by the way, also vice versa. Some of the inventions that they do in, in Macau, they bring back uh, back here. Where earlier we were talking about Hong Kong, also has some incredible neon that's gradually uh, disappearing. So uh, yeah, there is neon in other parts of the world. That's it's equally interesting. Well, maybe not as interesting as <laughs> stuff here. <laughs> Could, could you flip back to your title slide and ask a question about the, um, uh, you, you mentioned renderings for a second ago, but yeah, the title, yeah. Um, those are great sketches. Yeah. Um, how did you, how did they get generated that are anatomically correct and great perspective of the shadow? So this, this is just a 3D model. So I, I use historical uh, uh, photos and to rebuild this in, 3D, um, and then we uh, take a shot, and this is called an isometric or axiometric type of drawing. So it doesn't have perspective, uh, so that means you can measure the depth. It's a, it's a type of drawing that architects like to use. It's more scientific than perspective, maybe it fits. It's a little drier. It's not as sexy as, as perspective is. Uh, and then, then they're colored up uh, in Illustrator. Was the native file 2D and straight on you? Uh, so the native file is actually a 3D, uh, but then uh, from that is, uh, is, is a, an isometric is turned into a 2, 2D and then colored up into Illustrator. So the, the software was a uh, Rhino, it's a, it's a typical software for architects. So I, I have them all in 3D and I'm waiting for an exhibit so I can print them all, 3D print them. Have them all there so you can look at them. Uh, so I'm working on that. Do you, you think you'll exhibit in Vegas? Yeah, I would love to. So I, I, I have a, a show that opens in the Netherlands, the Dutch Design Museum, uh, the 20th of February. And uh, I, I, tomorrow I'm meeting with the director of the gallery here, and hoping to 
pitch him this idea and can maybe jointly uh, display some of the new museum stuff. So if you happen to know him, please put in a <laughs> word. <laughs> 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 uh, what's his name? Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. Oh, Jerry. Oh, at the university. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Or if you know another gallery director, <laughs> let me know. It's a quite, quite amazing material that uh, is part of this. So uh, those two professors I talked about, uh, Bob Venturi and Nisco Brown, they made, in the 1968, they made an entire elevation of the strip taking photos. These are eight feet long uh, drawing uh, or photos, and I showed only a tiny part of that. All the way to the end, so let's just not go back. But uh, the AP line, I, I made the version of today, so you can compare uh, the two. So those are on display right now. It's could quite she, amazing to see. Could you see all the pylon signs that we showed before? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the full thing was fascinating. Where is it? It's rolling. Yeah. There. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. It's still a working process. It's not, it's not all of them. It's still being edited. You can sell postcards. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you see uh, some of them were, uh, a gentleman took pictures of some of them when they had the, when they first opened in the museum. Took pictures and he was going to print them in big size and sell them. Uh, in fact, I signed a couple of them for him, you know. Uh, I did the, uh, the last one I did was the, the fourth generation mm. uh, sand. Yeah. Mm. It's there somewhere. Mm. It's it's there. White ones. Yeah. Sand. Yeah, I see. Yes. Oh, this one. The sun on the top. Oh, wow. Yeah, that one right That's there. a beautiful one. It's great. Yeah. That was, how did you come up with that? Design? I tried to modernize it, I believe. When I first came to Las Vegas, somebody asked me, one of the Someone asked me to design sign out of pizza. Can you believe that? <laughs> That's the mentality I had to face in the first game to the biggest kind of cowboy type of thing, you know. And 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 I tried to change that attitude until Steve Boeing came along and the design changed a lot. Really. But my favorite, the sixty signs are Yeah. <laughs> you know, some of the early signs. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. These animal paints. Uh, that was uh, 1950s, 60s. Then it changed for uh, these plastic acrylics in the 1970s. Plastic acrylics, and then the yes. earlier ones were on the metal sheets. Yeah, sheet metal. Were these categories something all sort of? Yeah, so I think if, so. If you look, if you look at you know the Charles Bernard book, I think he talks about this shift from the golden age of science that, that, that sort of ended here. I think a lot of people acknowledge that, and that uh, the flamingo was the last one, and then it went downhill. <laughs> but that's not entirely true. Because there is also, some, you know, a lot of interesting structures that were built, like the silver bird, right, which is quite interesting because it has a port chair and then it has uh, a pylon integrated in it. So I think there's a lot less attention to signage after the golden age of signage. So all these monumental signs, I don't think anyone has ever written about that. And that was quite amazing, I thought, because you know these are <laughs> signs. As, as, as Follows an entire building, and the uh, the Paris balloon I think is very inventive, inventive sign. Right? That the the basket was turned into video screens uh, and picture frames. I think it's worthwhile to mention that some of my contemporaries have passed away. They are icons mm -hmm. of the sign industry. Mm -hmm. uh, Raul Rodriguez, yeah, uh, yeah. Margie designed. Yeah, Las Vegas, an uh, icon sign. Uh, Fleming, classic Fleming, yeah. they both passed away. I'm last of the people timers, I think. Yeah. There's one trend that I didn't really discuss again, this is a quite a reductionist story. 
that's how uh, a lot of lighting is being incorporated into the building facades. If you look at the cosmopolitan, actually the facade itself includes a lot of lighting patterns. We see the same in uh, very new casinos in Macau. So design designers, they merge more with uh, architectural design and we get some sort of a hybrid, super advanced uh, architectural envelopes.